What would you think if I told you that there is an island in America which, at one point, almost became Russian territory? And indeed, the Russian flag was raised there. This island, by the way, has nothing to do with Alaska, which you probably already know was once Russian. But what if I tell you that besides Alaska, Russia also had a territory in California, and the island over which the Russian flag was hoisted is not just some empty piece of land. Today, this territory is the Hawaiian Islands, the largest state in America, which has a record low population compared to other states, about 700,000 people, Alaska. Alaska is a vast territory with an abundance of resources, faithfully serving the interests of the United States of America. But it wasn't always like this. Look here, this is the town of Russian Mission, and nearby is the Russian Mission Nunvochuk Lake Airfield. What's so surprising about that? But these towns are located in Alaska, on the Yukon River, and this is not the only example. There are towns named in Russian in other corners of America. For instance, St. Petersburg in Florida, Moscow in Idaho, Odessa in Texas. But the main difference is that these towns are named due to certain events, sometimes based on local population, while the towns in Alaska are named deliberately. It's fascinating that Alaska belonged to two countries, which are now practically adversaries on the world stage, Russia and America. But how did Alaska end up remaining with America and not continue as part of Russia? Many already know the answer to this question, but today we will delve into it more deeply. Russian towns, settlements, Russian-speaking population, national Russian cuisine in America may sound strange, but all the above exists in America to this day. Let's take a look at the map. This is roughly how Russian territory looked in 1867. As you can see, Alaska is part of Russia, and notably, it was part of Russia for over 100 years. Alaska was discovered in 1732 by members of the Russian Empire's expedition, Mikhail Gvozdev and Fedorov. Before this, Russia already knew about the neighboring continent around 1648 from the Russian sailors of Semyon Desnyov's expedition who discovered Alaska from Siberia. But the expedition was not officially successful. There's a legend that some members of the expedition might have landed on the American shore during a shipwreck and founded the first non-viable settlement. This is roughly what the map of Russian maritime discoveries in the Pacific and Arctic Oceans looked like. Note that the oceans are referred to as seas, as the sailors did not have more information. To the left is part of Asia, the Sea of Okhotsk, the Kamchatka Sea, and to the right is the continent part of the northwest coast of America. The map is not complete or accurate, but this is all that Russian sailors had in 1802. Here you can also see the Kuril Islands, the island of Sakhalin, Kamchatka, and most of the territories depicted on it belong to the emperor of the Russian Empire, at least according to this map. Here we have the USA on the world map, and this is the 50th state, the Hawaiian Islands. For those who may not know, there are exactly 50 states in America, not 52 or 51. However, the fact that Hawaii is numbered 50 signifies that it was the last territory to join the United States of America. This happened quite recently, just 64 years ago, in 1959. Russia almost colonized the Hawaiian Islands, and it was a close call before military ships and peacekeepers might have appeared. But at one point, the Russian Empire voluntarily relinquished these territories. Giving up such a large piece of land in a geopolitically advantageous location, a strategically important place for Russia, does not sound like a very sensible move. However, Russia did this voluntarily and, moreover, has never again laid claim to these territories, based on two principles. The first is that the more territories you have, the harder they are to control, considering that the Russian Empire's territory was already vast, with a large population whose standard of living was less than desirable. The second principle is that friendship with other countries is much more beneficial than war. Now, let's look at the west coast of the USA. It's 500 miles from Los Angeles and 400 from the Canadian border. At some point, the typical American landscape changes. 
and instead of highways and McDonald's, an old Russian fortress appears, as if old believers live there. Wooden houses, wells, everything slightly askew. How did this happen? Let's go back to the mid-17th century. This was an era when superpowers divided the world. The most powerful and developed nations were considered to be in Europe. During this era, the principle was, whoever arrives first owns the territory. And Alaska became Russian on exactly this principle. Alaska was rich in resources. In the 17th century, these were furs. Fur at that time was like gold or oil is for us now. Therefore, Russian expeditions constantly sailed to Alaska to hunt for furs for further resale. It sounds quite profitable. Sail on a ship, shoot a few animals, and sail home with money, considering that fur cost a fortune, and fortunes were made from it. Sables, foxes, beavers. The hunting was so extensive that at one point there were almost no wild animals left in Siberia. But Alaska still had plenty, and there were unique animals there, called colons, with the densest fur, 100,000 hairs per square centimeter, which sounds wonderful from the expedition member's point of view. But in reality, it was not so simple. It turns out that Alaska was also home to the indigenous population of America, Indians, Aleuts, and others. At one point, the uninvited guests became too bold, began to subjugate the local population and seize territory, leading to the Fur Wars. The Indians were fewer in number, but they were armed. As a result, the Indians burned Russian settlements and the Russians killed the Indians, but eventually they somehow agreed on peace and commercial hunting continued. It's important to know that although Alaska was part of Russia, it was not like any other region of Russia, such as Moscow, St. Petersburg, or Novgorod. Alaska was more like a colony of that time, managed from the mainland from St. Petersburg, which at that time was the capital of the Russian Empire. To manage Alaska, Russia registered a company called the Russian American Company. Russia became a partner of this company, similar to how the USA now has partnerships with Amazon, Apple, and so on. Notably, the company that managed Alaska also dealt with furs. This small company had its own army, its own flag, and the capital of Alaska became the city of Novo Arkhangelsk, a fortress under the Russian flag. Today, the capital of Alaska is still there, but now the city is called Sitka and belongs to the USA. Interestingly, on the maps, there are still some funny Russian names to this day. For example, Samovar Hills, Port Alexander, McNaughty Island. And don't forget that Alaska is the largest state in America. Its area is 1.7 million square kilometers, or 18% of the total area of the USA. About 19 US states could fit into Alaska. New York, Florida, Oklahoma, Indiana, Pennsylvania. And do you know how many Americans live on these vast expanses now? Attentive viewers will surely remember, as we mentioned it at the beginning of the video, just over 700,000 people, making it one of the least populated states in the USA. But you'll be even more surprised when I tell you how many Russians lived there 200 years ago. 100,000, 200,000, 50,000? At its best, about 2,000 people from the Russian Empire lived in Alaska. That is, one person per 850 square kilometers. It's like if in the smallest US state, Rhode Island, there was only one person living. There was no centralized program for the settlement of Alaska by the Russian Empire. Nonetheless, each year around five ships set sail from Russia to Alaska, and on board each of them was a crew of 30, 40, 50, or even 100 people. These individuals were sourced from Siberia, recruited for work, which means these people had quite a troubled past, including former convicts, murderers, maniacs, and thieves. Instead of free industrial workers hired under contract, the ship was filled with exiled criminals, whom Shelikov, one of the leaders of the Russian-American company, bargained for with the Siberian governor. Both sides were satisfied with the deal. The governor got rid of a group of useless and dangerous hard labor convicts, while Shelikov acquired laborers. The Russians brought with them to Alaska their traditional drink, vodka. 
This led to widespread drunkenness, and even the prohibition law couldn't save the situation, as these same people revolted against the dry law. And all this was the doing of one man, Alexander Baranov, who was in charge of Alaska. However, behind him were also positive aspects. For instance, he tried to reconcile with the local population and built churches for them. He requested that priests be sent from St. Petersburg to begin baptizing the local population. And the new faith was so well received by the locals that to this day, among the indigenous population of Alaska, there are those who still adhere to orthodoxy. The male immigrants were in dire need of women. However, the girls from the local population were treated like slaves. They were obliged to cook food, gather berries and mushrooms, and sew clothes. But if a local girl married one of the immigrants, the situation changed. The girl was freed from all mandatory work. She moved into his house, gained rights, and children from such marriages became full citizens of Russia upon birth. They were sent to study in St. Petersburg or other Russian cities. After which, they returned and continued to work for the benefit of Russia's colonization of Alaska. Alaska is a unique place and was of interest not only to Russia, but also to Great Britain, which at that time was the strongest empire in the world. These lands were particularly interesting to America, or more precisely the USA, a country that was already well-formed, developed, and rapidly expanding. At that time, the USA looked like this, 24 states, all of them in the east. The lands to the south and west initially belonged to Spain, then Mexico, and the north was dominated by Great Britain. And in Alaska, Russia was also making its mark. This created a tense situation on the continent, and it was very difficult for Russia to control Alaska from St. Petersburg, given the immense distance. Do you know what the journey was like from St. Petersburg to Alaska? This information is well documented by Krusenstern's quote. In spring, they would take a carriage, changing horses every hundred kilometers, and rush eastward. In June, they cross the Volga River. In July, they pass through the Ural Mountains, and by August, they reach the banks of the Ob River. After crossing the Ob, then the Yenisei, they arrived in Irkutsk with the first snowfall. Here, they waited for the real winter to set in. Then, they took sleds and sped along the frozen course of the Lena River to Yakutsk. They arrived in Yakutsk in January and stayed there until spring, as travel through the taiga in winter was impossible. Spring brought the thaw and flooding, making travel equally unfeasible. They waited until June and then set off on reindeer along forest paths. By August, they reached Okhotsk. Sails were hoisted, they crossed the Sea of Okhotsk, and by September they arrived in Kamchatka. In Kamchatka, they overwintered again, and only the following summer did they set sail across the Bering Sea to America. In general, the journey took two years one way and about the same time to return. Similarly, food was transported to Alaska via the same route because nothing grew in Alaska, and there was a need to feed the people somehow. However, Alaska had an abundance of fish, but bread could not be grown. Cucumbers and cabbage also grew poorly, and there was a shortage of meat. On average, this amounted to about 70 grams of meat per person per day. And it wasn't free. The prices here were exorbitant. A chicken cost about 5 rubles, while the salary of a simple worker was about 30 rubles a month. Roughly speaking, a sixth of the salary. The situation was exacerbated by the fact that all the food arrived not fresh, often wet, and sometimes even expired. There was no flour, wheat didn't grow in Alaska, and baking bread was impossible, so something had to be done. Russia looked southward for places where something could be grown, and this turned out to be California. It was about 2,000 kilometers away, approximately a one or two week journey by ship at best. Coincidentally, at the same time on the other end of Russia, a war was raging. It was the year 1812. Napoleon was already in Moscow, entering the Kremlin, and Russia lost half a million people in this war. Imagine, 
In one part of the world, there's an expedition and colonization of new lands. And in another, your country is being dismantled brick by brick. The Russians settled by a river they called Slavyanka, or the Russian River. It was only 80 kilometers from San Francisco. The settlement was named Fort Ross. It had a huge three-meter fence with 20 centimeter thick logs. There were watchtowers at the corners and 12 cannons for the fort's protection. Look at the powerful log houses with sturdy roofs that could withstand a ton of snow built as they were in Siberia and now in California where it snows once in 40 years and the temperature in January is about 10 degrees Celsius. The Russians built their houses with the permission of the Indians. They didn't take or buy the land, but traded it, as legend has it, for three blankets, three pairs of trousers, two axe, three hoes, and a few strings of beads. They settled in California, but it turned out that even better lands were nearby. These were the Hawaiian Islands. The point is that there were neither Spaniards nor Great Britain, which at that time were colossal powers. It is known that only natives lived in Hawaii who were not particularly prepared for an invasion, but in reality, it turned out to be more complicated as the Hawaiians were not savages. They had harsh and strict rules, a code of laws, their own morals. You might have heard of a man named James Cook, a certain traveler who had been almost all over the world, but ended his journey in Hawaii as he was killed there very brutally. Moreover, Hawaii had a dual authority. Besides the main ruler, there was another king who wanted to overthrow the first and take all of Hawaii for himself. To feel stronger, he asked for support from the Russians who had already arrived on the island and managed to raise the Russian flag. To make the operation successful, it was necessary to send just two ships from St. Petersburg and all of Hawaii would have become Russian territory. But Alexander the Rhee officially refused the Paradise Island in such an important and strategic location. During this time, a lot was happening in Europe. There were several wars. Alexander the Rai died, and the Decembrist uprising broke out, many of whose members were top managers in Alaska. When the uprising was suppressed, Emperor Nicholas I, who replaced the Decembrists with his own people, ascended the throne. But they were not as interested in developing Alaska. Alaska didn't immediately become part of the USA. First, Fort Ross in California, which had just won a war over these lands against Mexico, was ceded to America. Then, the question arose about what to do with Alaska. At this point, Alaska's value soared as gold was discovered there, sparking a gold rush. This was when gold hunters from all over the world flocked there, and Russia understood that American soldiers would soon appear to protect this gold extraction. Nicholas the Wise suggested abandoning Alaska and starting the development of Russia's underdeveloped territories. These would at least be easier to settle, protect, and supply. St. Petersburg began negotiations with Washington, but the USA was engulfed in a civil war and Alaska was temporarily forgotten. Meanwhile, Russia was losing the Crimean War, resulting in huge holes in the budget. The Russian ambassador in the USA began bargaining for Alaska, asking for $8 million. Washington offered $7 million, and they finally settled on $7.2 million. Here's the actual check the Americans wrote for the purchase of Alaska. For $7.2 million, 6% 6 of the Russian Empire was sold, or 1.5 million square kilometers, at roughly one cent for 200 hectares. This is what the signing of the treaty in Washington looked like on March 30th, 1867. In the autumn of the same year, the Russian flag was lowered in New Archangel, the capital of Russian America. America offered local Russian residents the chance to stay in Alaska and provided them citizenship, but most chose to leave. The money from the sale of Alaska to the USA, contrary to legend, did not sink in the sea or get stolen. Russia used almost the entire amount to purchase equipment for Russian railways in the USA. Few remember, but these friendly business relations between the USA and Russia greatly aided the development of Russian railways. Over time, the USA and Russia actively cooperated and even, in a sense, were friends, speaking highly of each other upon entering New York Harbor. Until now, no one has ever seen such unanimous expression of sympathy towards anyone.
Let the whole world looking at us and marveling at us ponder what all those salvos from our and the Russian military ships at the entrance to New York Harbor meant. When Alexander II was sending a new ambassador to the USA, he gave him an interesting piece of advice. You must always remember that our best friend is the American people. Only 156 years have passed since the sale of Alaska. During this time, three generations have changed. And if we look at this situation today, we can only shake our heads in bewilderment and wonder, how did it come to this? How could two superpowers become so estranged? Of course, the sale of Alaska was beneficial for both the USA and Russia. For Russia, it was a lifeline in a difficult moment. And for the USA, it was a huge and powerful investment in the future, which also saved the USA from unpleasant strategic enemies at its borders. In our videos, we have already talked about the two islands belonging to Russia and America in the Bering Strait. You can watch that video, and you can also check out our other videos.